Good day, everyone, and welcome to the WE program, Invest in Her, Empowering Women's Ventures. I'm Nathania Ferguson, manager of the Office of Innovation Outreach, and I'll be your MC for today's program. I want to thank you for joining us. You could have spent your time in other ways, and a big thank you to both our in-person and virtual audience. I'm sure that you will leave today's program with learning something on how to take the next steps for starting or growing your business. I also have to give a big thank you to our gracious hosts, Fela Meyer and the Women's Business Enterprise Council South team. We, we appreciate you sharing with us this beautiful space, the WB Collective in New Orleans. Um, the space is not only beautiful, Fela, but it's such a collaborative working environment. As soon as we entered the room, we were greeted with such positive, creative energy. Um, but before we get started, I wanna give some housekeeping notes for our virtual audience. If at any time you get disconnected, please don't worry, just simply use the link that brought you here to the program and you'll be connected back with us. We will not be taking questions from the audience today. Uh, we're on a tight schedule, but don't worry. You can connect with us. We want to hear your questions and comments. Please simply email us at we at USPTO.gov. This program is for you, and we value your feedback. We will be asking you to complete a survey at the end of the program, so please take a few minutes to give us your feedback. Now let's get into today's program. Last November, Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo and the Director of USPTO Kathy Vidal launched the Empowering Women Entrepreneurs Initiative to inspire, educate, and lift up women entrepreneurs. Over the past year, we've had the privilege of connecting with hundreds of amazing women entrepreneurs. We see you, we appreciate you, and the hard work of women entrepreneurs developing novel innovations to solve problems, creating products and services to improve our lives, the quality of life, starting businesses to lift up your communities. The work that you are doing is important and we acknowledge that. And we collectively have to do more. So at the USPTO, we will continue to provide equitable access to relevant resources that assist women entrepreneurs with using your creative works to reach your full potential. Connect women entrepreneurs with networks and mentors that will help you navigate throughout your journey of innovation and leverage the important work of other organizations, such as the minority business agencies empowering capital readiness initiatives that support and foster women's innovation and entrepreneurship. Speaking of the Minority Business and Development Agency, MBDA, it is now my pleasure to welcome MBDA's first undersecretary, Mr. Don Cravens, Jr. Mr. Cravens will be providing us with remarks. Thank you. Hi, and good morning, everyone. It is so good to be here with you um, here in this wonderful, wonderful facility. Um, as my my the, our gracious MC said, I'm Don Cravens, and I'm honored to serve as our the MBDA's first undersecretary, uh, the first undersecretary for Minority Business Development at the Department of Commerce. And so it's a blessing and an honor to be here. I want to thank my dear friend, uh, Ms. Fayla Meyer, uh, her entire team here at the Women's Business Enterprise Council South. When when Kathy Vidal, Undersecretary Vidal. Uh, was helping plan this wonderful week. She said, I want a place where we can do something that's really cool and that that entrepreneurs will want to be a space, a, a, a great space. I said, I've got the perfect place for you. And every time I come here, Fela, you and your entire team, uh, the women and the men who, who help build what you're doing, the success here, this is just one of our best centers, best places to be. I come here and I feel energized and I understand about the work. It helps me do the work that I'm doing. So thank you for hosting us today. I also want to thank Ms. Tiffany Carter. Where's Tiffany? Tiffany, who is the director of MBDA's New Orleans Enterprising Women of Color Program. And so to be able to be here in this space with our colleagues from the Department of Commerce who are at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, but to say welcome to an MBDA center. I hope that even our colleagues who do all the great work with copyrights and patents and trademark 
you get a chance to see kind of how we do things at MBDA and how the two of us can be working more, more together. And so I do want to thank my partners from the USPTO for joining us here today. We have Ms. Valencia Martin-Wallace, who's the Deputy Commissioner for Patents at the U.S. Uh, Patent and Trademark Office, a New Orleans native, and so happy to have her back at home. Um, promoting equity in the intellectual property space is critical but it's often not discussed, especially not discussed in, in black communities or in communities of color. Uh, I hope that today will help change that. I hope that today we'll give some entrepreneurs of color, women entrepreneurs, a better understanding of the resources that are available in this space. I gave a speech just a few minutes ago and many of you were there, but there's so many resources right now, but many of our entrepreneurs are still having a tough time getting access to them. And I hope today we'll, we'll, we'll help bridge some of that. I also want to give a special shout out to Dr. Frazier, the CEO of Obatala Sciences. Where's Dr. Frazier? Hey, Doc. She is participating in today's first panel. Now, let me brag about Dr. Frazier. Uh, she has, is, is a perfect example of the wonderful work that this center is doing with these tremendous entrepreneurs who are coming in with great ideas and, and solutions. Um, they just need some help somebody to talk to, some, somebody to help them pull themselves about the boots and straps, and this place gives you boots and straps to do that. Dr. Frazier this year received the MBDA's Minority Health Products and Service Firm of the Year. Let's give her a round of applause. And so I was so grateful to, to, to present that award to her at MBDA's National Minority Enterprising Development Week Awards Conference. Um, and so we're very, very proud. I'll let her speak more about her great accomplishments on her panel. I won't take your talking points, Doc. But her company is just doing outstanding work, breaking new ground in the biotechnology industry. She's the first woman to raise more than a million dollars in venture capital to grow a biotech firm in New Orleans. Awesome. So as you can see, events like today are critical to both the MBDA and the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office's collective mission to help expand opportunities for underserved businesses. And that certainly includes women of color owned businesses as well. From limited resources like access to capital, it's hard, very difficult, we know that, to access to contracts, to having to do twice the work um, and half the time to stand out in male dominated industries. Women of color entrepreneurs face unique systemic barriers to success. There are fewer women owned firms than firms owned by men. They are smaller, they employ fewer people, and despite enormous strides in education and equality in the workplace, the gap that women face in pay and social capital, senior level experience, all contribute to the resources women have when launching and scaling their business ventures. We also see this in the intellectual property space. Today, women make up only 12% of all US inventors despite being more than half of the population in America. And that's just not good enough. We can do better. We can do better here in New Orleans. We can do better here in Louisiana. We can do better in our great country. So as the first undersecretary of minority business development, these are the types of challenges I am committed to. I like Ms. Ms. Valencia, I'm a native of this state and we, we did come through some tough times and we continue to come through some tough times. And so we don't forget who we are and from where we come. And those are the challenges I know we are all committed to addressing because we know that if we bet on our minority women businesses, we're betting on the future and we're gonna win. We will win. Despite the challenges that you've all faced, women continue to drive our economy forward. Minority women are the fastest growing population of entrepreneurs. Nearly 50% of all women owned firms are owned by women of color. In fact, as of 2019, 6.4 million minority women owned firms employed 2.3 million employees across the nation. What's more is that breaking down these barriers and ensuring parity with non-minority women-owned businesses would mean 4 million new jobs and $981 billion in revenue in being added to the economy. So when our minority women do well, when black women do well, Hispanic, Latina, Latinas do well, we all do well. We all do well. So just imagine the possibilities. MBDA is here to work with you, to collaborate with you. It's a collective mission. We wanna give every entrepreneur, every woman, every person an equitable shot at the American dream. That is what's at the heart of what we're doing here. That is what's at the heart of our EWOC, our Enterprising Women of Color Center. That is what, what is at the heart of all the work that's going on here. And so I just, again, it's an honor to be here. I hope today we have fun and we talk about some great things, but I hope it's also um, reigniting that we have a lot of work to do. And it's not always easy, but together, and those who are watching, we can get it done. We can get it done. So thank you all for having me. 
Um, have a wonderful rest of your visit here in the great city of New Orleans, the great city of Louisiana. Eat some great food and then go back and let's get to work making sure that we can close these gaps. Thank you very much. God bless you. Wow, I was excited, but now I'm even more excited. Thank you for the insightful um, remarks under Secretary Craven. So now it's my pleasure to invite Taylor Meyer to the stage. She's going to moderate our next panel. We're gonna have a rich panel discussion, We're gonna learn a lot. We're gonna learn about how we move forward and how we will help women entrepreneurs succeed. So I'm gonna hand over my mic to Taylor. All right, and as I am welcoming everybody again to our space, we'd love our panel to come up and go ahead and get yourself seated. We've got some really uh, great uh, ladies that are going to be sharing some information, and we're going to be talking about the entrepreneurial journey and experience with patents and trademarks and how it really influences the direction of your business and helps contribute to your success. All right, so everybody see? Need a sound check or are you good? Okay. All right, ladies, let me see everybody. <laughs> good morning. Morning. All right, so we're going to share with the audience information. I think that will be inspirational. And how many business owners do we have here in the audience? All right, great. So we've got some information that we we're gonna share with you. And on our panel, we've got some really, um, expert voices for you who are gonna tell their stories, help share information that I think will be helpful to everybody in the audience here, but also for our virtual audience as well. We have two really dynamic entrepreneurs, one that was already introduced by Undersecretary Cravens, but we're gonna let her introduce herself, as well as Christy Landrew, our other entrepreneurial voice on the, on the panel. And then we have a voice from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And so I want all of you all to kind of introduce yourselves, talk about what you do and who you are. Dr. Frazier, we'll start with you. Thank you. Wonderful to be here. Uh, my name is Trivia Frazier. I'm the president, co-founder, and CEO of Obatala Sciences. We are a biotechnology toolkit firm that's advancing research in the areas of obesity and diabetes. And at its core, what we do is we isolate stem cells from patients of varying demographics. We uh, then use those cells, put them in a nice, lovely environment where they feel like they're at home, like they do inside the body, and use that for screening therapies. And it's bringing representation of patients uh, in demographics that are traditionally not included at the clinical stage of development, uh, a drug development, so women and people of color or racial ethnic backgrounds, um, older individuals, younger individuals, and those that range across a spectrum of diseases. Yes, my name is Christy Landrew. I am the founder and CEO of a business called Utopia Creations. We do creative design and we work with organizations where we license the IP of those organizations and then create accessories, jewelry, apparel, and whatnot. And we also work with some um, small women-owned businesses and their firms in creating um, products that they use for their swag, if you will, for different events that they might host or hold and what so forth. Glad to be here. Thank you. All right. And now we have our Deputy Commissioner for Patents. You want to introduce yourself and tell everybody what you do? Yes, thank you. And good morning to everyone. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, Valencia Martin Wallace, a native of New Orleans. Uh, <laughs> can't tell you how great it is every time I come home. <laughs> Welcome home. I, I am Deputy Commissioner for Patents and part of uh, the position there, uh, I oversee our um, international patent cooperation, so with other IPOs around the world to make sure that we not only harmonize the processes and procedures to uh, the patent system, but also making sure that we can do as much as we can to make sure that there's appropriate protection around the world for patents, um, as well as uh, I oversee uh, both utility technology centers that examine and and allow um, applications as patents, as well as our industrial design uh, patents as well. 
And that's my day job, uh, my part-time job, but which is my passion, is working on uh, a program with the Undersecretary, uh, Kathy Vidal, called Council for Inclusive Innovation, that brings together all sectors of the innovation community, that's industry, both large and small, uh, academia, uh, government, nonprofits, uh, venture capitalists, as well as independent inventors, on a council to work with the USPTO and developing programs uh, and initiatives that will resolve, and I, I use that word exactly, resolve this issue of underrepresentation and a lack of equity within our innovation community to pull together to develop the programs that are going to bring education and awareness to everyone in this country about the intellectual property system, the value, regardless of the type of creative ideas you have, to make sure that you know about protecting that. Well, I got to tell you that uh, when I heard about this panel and this event, um, we were super excited. Um, representing an organization that works specifically to help grow, develop, and connect women business owners uh, with bigger opportunities, larger opportunities to do business and to really grow their businesses as large as they can be. Um, it's very exciting to me to talk about some of the issues that a lot of entrepreneurs have. And one is protection of intellectual property. Second being access to capital. And we kind of tie those together here in this panel because of your experiences. And so I'm going to start with our entrepreneurs on the panel and tell the audience a little bit about, I know you've talked about your company, but tell them specifically about your intellectual property protections and the route that you went to protect um, your intellectual property so that you can move forward in developing your business. What was that for you? Dr. Fraser. Yeah, so we have a um, a patent portfolio that includes, well, a IP portfolio, I'll say, IP. that includes patents, uh, trade secrets, and uh, trademarks. And um, the journey for me uh, started out one with one in which I was completely unaware of what an IP portfolio could consist of. You know, I was about to say, why don't you just start there <laughs> for yeah. entrepreneurs who don't even understand that there is such a thing as an IP portfolio. What is that? Yes, mean? yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, and we speak about value, um, you know, all of those things that sort of build up as you learn about this. An intellectual property portfolio is essentially a combination, it could be a combination of the different, and I'll call them tools, patents, trade secrets, trademarks, um, copyrights, and I'm sure you could explain this better than me, um, <laughs> that could be used collectively to uh, essentially strengthen your position within your markets, your space that you're working in, um, that your technology is in, but also help to provide a barrier for entry for others who would like to come in and say, okay, this is mine, right? There's um, historically being a New Orleans native, I also see within our space mu musicians historically that time and time again, didn't realize that there was a way for them to protect their intellectual property, the things that they came up with. And you, we hear all the time, all these stories, yes, this person created that, but the other person stole it. Um, and it was, you know, made, popular and, and went on the main stage by the person that stole it or their team. And so that was the only introduction that I had to intellectual property. Okay. And in academia, the goal is to get funding, to support your research, to um, teach. And that was my goal to be involved with students. I love that interaction, bringing my research to life. But Nowhere in that training program did I receive any wise words to say, consider if you are developing something that's new, something that's novel, something that's innovative, just have a conversation with the Office of Technology Transfer at the university and find out if this is something that's worth protecting, if there's a way for us to look at this because research, the focus is just research. Um, and so I see a number of academicians that also have sort of that it's it's daunting, that fear of, well, I, 
how do I even approach that? I don't know if it's worth my time, my energy, my effort. I have to focus on getting an R01 grant. I, I don't have time to do that. And so that, you know, that was the entry point to me, uh, for me. The company, now we have uh, patents that we are pursuing that are essentially covering our core technology. And the second um, introduction to this pathway for me was how difficult it could be to pursue a patent around um, innovation with biology, native biology. Um, and that whole, I don't wanna get into sort of the, the technical aspects of that, but um, we've, we learned to, to incorporate other aspects um, that bring value and create those barriers to entry, namely trade secrets, partially because of that, where essentially the only people who have access to the method of, of manufacturing our materials that maintain that intellectual aptitude are our staff that access our standard operating protocols, our SOPs. And that is, you know, there's a process around it. It is recognized to be the process. Only certain people have access to it. And because of that, it retains value in a similar manner to a patent. Christine, you're not acting, but you also have protected property. And yes. property. How old was your journey? So, so I actually started before my business became the business it is today. I started on the premise of see a need, fill a need. Um, and so when I became an entrepreneur, I started working with other small women owned businesses, like I stated. And one of them, um, a couple of the women, as we talked through some things that they were doing and developing their brand, um, whether that was speaking, um, whether, you know, what that personality was going to be for their brand, we talked about trademarking some of their. Um, IP in terms of marks, et cetera. And so that's where I first started, you know, researching. I'm not an attorney, I'm an electrical engineer by education. And so I started the journey of educating myself on what that meant, what that looked like in terms of registering a trademark. And so as I began to work with them and we successfully registered about six marks with the women businesses that I was creating, my business took a turn into a niche business where I actually started licensing the IP of other women organizations and creating under those um, for those organizations and selling to their members, much like you know collegiate licensing companies, et cetera. But I was doing it for sororities, if you will. Um, and so I immediately found out. I started designing, and within three months of creating a design, which at that time was a brooch that women wear on the lapel, right? Within three months of creating that design, I was at a show. And two vendors down from me, someone was selling my design. And I was like, wait a minute, whoa, what is going on right now? And so I immediately started again researching. I knew I wanted to register my brand, but I wasn't sure I wanted to keep the name Utopia Creations at the time, right? I really wasn't sure what my portfolio was going to look like. I was just kind of moving, see a need, fill a need. And, you know, it's moving in my creative space. And so I immediately saw that I needed to do something because I was losing, I was losing out on capital. So I, um, I started researching and I ended up copywriting the design. And so I looked up what that looks like in terms of copyright versus a trademark. And so I have successfully registered my brand now as a trademark Utopia Creations. And in my portfolio, I have additional copyrights where I've um, copyrighted some designs that I've created. But I'm learning here today as well. <laughs> and so we have some homework to go back and do and we were kind of catching up in the green room if you will um but that's how i started and so it's been a little different from dr frazier's here but again i recognized the need immediately to protect the ip and the creative art that i was you know creating and i saw the value because immediately like i said someone had decided to copy and sell that design, you know, right from under me and within three months, and it's still a wildly popular design. So we've got two really different experiences, but Valencia, uh, there are so many different, such a diverse array of entrepreneurs out there with so many different products and services and intellectual cap capital and property that they need to protect. What are the resources of the USPTO? And, you know, now that we're hearing about you know a portfolio what does that mean what are the resources where does somebody start so that's a that's a great question um there are 
just a multitude of resources right at the USPTO uh, that can be accessed through our webpage that help anyone with any entrepreneur, any small business, independent inventor who might not necessarily um, understand the differences between intellectual property, might know one, might know trademarks and the brand and how to do that, but not necessarily others and not necessarily know exactly where their idea falls. So one of the resources we have is called the uh, IP identifier. You can go right onto our webpage, put in some key information about your idea, and it, and it will tell you, okay, you have the possibility of a trademark, but you also have the possibility of a design patent and also the possibility of a utility patent because there's, just as these two very dynamic uh, women have said, that portfolio is is lev what leverages for your business to really protect you. And just because you receive one form of intellectual property, say a utility patent, let's say as simple as a chair, it has utility, it has function. It's a different design that no one has ever used to function this way. So you apply for your utility patent application through through the system but you've also created such a unique design that also gives you an opportunity to apply for a design patent which has to have function but the design is very unique and therefore you can get your protection there and if you start building these chairs just as as these ladies have told us you start building those chairs and start selling them well what's the name of your business and have you trademarked that business? Do you have unique articles in, and stories about your business? Have you copyrighted that? Mm -hmm. And it's identifying all of the different types of intellectual property, how to leverage them all to do as much holistic protection as possible from anyone who's coming to infringe on what is your idea. So that's one that we have. We have many, many resources and I wish I could go through all of them, but I'm, I'm enjoying listening to these ladies and I, I know you have a lot of questions. So I'll just say for anyone who really wants to know more about our resources, go on to our webpage, uh, Inclusive Innovation. We have series of training to help those from K through 20. We have for any adult learner training about the different types of intellectual property the process that we have in order to get it. We have training on how do you fill out the application because it's still a legal system and it can be very tricky. And if you put a, a number in the wrong box, you may get that application back saying, oh, there's a, def there's a deficiency here and you need to try again. So we help those who don't necessarily know the patent or the trademark system navigate that system. And that can be found on, found on our webpage as well. So I know we're going to have some subject matter experts speaking after this panel discussion that will be able to give you a lot more information about the, the specifics. But I really do encourage everyone to go on to the USPTO webpage to explore it and find out more training, as I said, on, on STEM, on STEAM, but let's not sleep on the, the creative arts because they deserve IP protection as well. Sure, sure, absolutely. And I'm glad you said that because hearing about the resources after this panel, I think is gonna be critical because there are so many different resources that are offered through your, your office. Um, so let's, let's, ladies, let's tie this back to, you know, the real importance of protecting your intellectual property, getting those trademarks, getting those patents, how is that important to you as a business owner? Obviously, it protects against people stealing your ideas or at least, you know, helps to, to mitigate some of that. But how does that help your business grow? How did you leverage your trademarks um, into being able to access capital and specifically investment capital? And, you know, Dr. Frazier, I know that Undersecretary Craven has mentioned that you have been successful in in getting over a million dollars in investment capital. And so what does that look like? And how, how was that journey for you? How did you tie those things? 
Yes, that's a great question. Um, and in terms of, um, I think the term that you used really hits it right uh, perfectly, leverage. Um, and so we leverage the uh, approach that we take to pursuing in new intellectual property protection, whether it's patents, trade secrets, trademarks, um, it, while we're pursuing federal funding. So there are federal funding mechanisms and being proactive about the way that you will protect new innovative technologies with the support of this federal funding really truly does help in terms of your application uh, while it's under review. Um, small business innovative research, uh, small technology transfer research, SBIR, STTR awards, anyone who is reviewing those awards, those applications rather, on a review panel will consider that, mm -hmm. will take that into consideration. We also leverage uh, the approach that we take and, and be proactive about speaking with that, particularly when we speak to venture capital funds. Uh, and anyone, whether it's from the stage of an angel, which is, you know, um, familiar, there's a familiar term by which it, it's coined, um, friends and fools, and friends, family and fools. Um, but truly, these are people who are passionate about, you know, a particular technology, a particular focus, a scope, and they want to support you right. and support your efforts all the way out to venture funds. And we've had discussions with all of them across the spectrum. We've raised since closing that 1 million, we've raised 5 million um, in venture capital. We've had about 5 million in, in grant support. All of that, we had to be proactive about how we would approach any technology that we currently have saying, here's the plan, here's who, um, our licensing partner is, if it's a license from a university. Uh, here's, you know, how we would approach this, if this funding, when this funding does come through in terms of continuing to build that portfolio. The reason why it's important on the venture capital side is that investors want to see that what they are investing in, that you are being proactive about protecting your technology and protecting the intellectual assets that come along with that. Um, and without that, there's such a great risk to it being essentially infringed on. And there's, you know, less of an avenue or a way for you to then go and be proactive about protecting that asset. Because what it comes down to at the end of the day is a return on assets and liabilities. Christy, I know your journey with funding your business and financing your business was a little different. So how does, you know, the trademarks, how do they affect your ability to really grow your business, to put it out there, to promote it um, to people who are interested in supporting you and helping you grow? Sure, absolutely. So for me, it is a different pathway. Um, it's not necessarily from a standpoint of leveraging the the brand portfolio, the the, the IP portfolio, um, but customers do you know want to see that if you are scaling to certain levels or if you are going into different co government contracts that you want to register in SAM and things like that, they they do want to know that you um, have protections. But for me, it allowed me in terms of scaling to um, as you go out to some of the different platforms like Amazon, um, et cetera they do want you to register or show that you have a registered brand. And so it helps me in that way in terms of scaling with what I'm doing in a retail e-commerce or a retail space. It, it helps show that we have brand identity and that we can register our products in that way. Okay. And, and just out of curiosity, mm -hmm. when you do find that people are infringing mm -hmm. on your, on your property, mm -hmm. what happens? What's the process for making sure that, you know, you are, 
protecting yourself using the trademarks that you have? What does that process look like? Sure. So it depends on the platform or, or where we see the infringement happening. If it's in person, then that's a conversation initially, um, just a courtesy conversation that, hey, where'd you get that? How did how'd you come about that? You know, well, you know, hey, I own that, you know. Okay, so it's, it's literally a conversation. Um, and, and it's done with a smile, but with information. Um, and then in on platforms or where you may not necessarily see the person, they have ways that you can register your IP um, and so that when you do see that infringement you can apply to have it taken down and so we've been able to successfully do that as well on multiple platforms from eBay Amazon Etsy etc right we've been able to um, go out and state that that's ours and after you know some time some research or whatever they require you to submit then it is taken down okay got it got it all right so knowing that there is a connection and a tie between maintaining an IP portfolio. Um, how does the USPTO help entrepreneurs in terms of really casting a wider net when they're looking to get investments and do fundraising and those things? How that's a great. That's a great question. Um, so, the USPTO has the authority to grant trademarks and to grant patents. Um, we're not a grant funding agency we don't we don't have uh, grants and funding but we as I mentioned earlier work with across the government and with nonprofits to make sure that those connections are made and that those resources that are out there are known by uh, people who are getting patents and trademarks um, I mentioned earlier the Council for inclusive innovation under Secretary uh, Cravens, who we heard from this morning, is a, is a proud member of our council uh, because there is a connection there. We also have the Economic Development uh, Agency that's on our council and the National Science Foundation, all of which have uh, grants. We're working with them to develop programs and initiatives that once you pass through our door, it's not over. So in so many ways, once you get that that protection of a, a registered trademark or the grant of a patent, your journey is just beginning. And it's our responsibility to make sure that we are giving you as much information on the next step as well. We may not be able to give you the grant or help you with the commercialization, but we can certainly give you the information you need through our collaborations and partnerships to know who to work with next and where those resources are. Yeah. And, uh, Women Entrepreneur Venture, this WE panel and what we're doing here is part of that. Getting the information about the resources, about how to find them out to all of, all of our, our entrepreneurs, our uh, inventors, the creators, and making sure that once our part is done, we, we've shared with you how to get to the next step of commercialization of the granting, the funding, and to see that reality of your idea on the market. Got it. Got it. All right. Dr. Frazier, in raising over a million dollars, and congratulations on that, that's just absolutely amazing um, accomplishment. But in doing that, I know a lot of people, you know, there are pitch competitions all over the place. And so even our organization, our national organization, you know, we're very invested in making sure and ensuring that women entrepreneurs understand, one, their value proposition and are able to walk on any stage and talk about what they have to offer, what their business is about in a way that interests people and wants them to either patronize, support, or invest. What does that, what are your, in your experience, um, what were some of the questions that stood out to you that people could prepare themselves for you? Because if you're in a pitch competition or if you're, you know, looking or courting investors, are there some common questions, maybe a top two or three, that you can talk about that people should prepare themselves for when they're really starting on that journey? Yes, another outstanding question because I wish I had known <laughs> that when I started to pitch. Um, the difficulty for me, which I did see across different fields, different industries, was uh, speaking about who I am, articulating who I am as a person, because I didn't understand that 
the investors, the investment community, really, they know nothing about you. Of course, you, you start to assume that, yeah, I'm in a room and I'm speaking to people, but truly they are investing at the earliest stage of the development of your entity, your company, your baby. They're investing in you. They're investing in the brain, the heart, the person behind the story who has started the entity and who is passionate about bringing it to that successful exit, which again, going back to that goal investing in a return from assets and liabilities that doesn't come without a person a team that's driving it and so that was the most difficult thing for me to truly incorporate into my pitch as an academician and just me as a, a person that did not like to boast about any aspect of what I've, has is considered to be an accomplishment but being able to just say this is who i am succinctly um, that very first slide for our pitch, when that was nailed down, everything else, you know, it became easier to, to give that pitch. The second thing that was difficult for me was how to water down the science. You know, when I thought that I wasn't speaking jargon, and this could be across any field, electrical engineering, you know, any field, it's recognizing Okay, if my five-year-old son, for me, can't understand what I'm saying, then maybe no. it's still too technical. Right. And it's not saying that that's the intellectual aptitude of the audience, but truly to be able to translate what you're saying in a, in a very clear way, again, succinctly. Those two things, um, in terms of the questions that come, that arise, the other one was, you know, and I truly did have to give thought to this, we started the company with all of this excitement, this drive, this emotion, connect, feeling that passion and connection to the science, to the research. And the thing that we had to think about when we incorporated the company was how we were going to exit it. Did we want to exit it? What type of structure you know, did we want that is directly connected to where we saw this going? Is it something that I want to hold on to forever? Um, and and have some sort of organic growth, more of a slower growth, family-based business. What does that look like? And really giving it thought and and putting it out there. Yeah, yeah. I just want to hit on one thing you said because when you were talking about um, overcoming some some obstacles, and I think a lot of times as women business owners, there are a lot of mental obstacles, and one is about really being able to tell your story in a way that does not feel like bragging. I find that women tend to be very humble and not necessarily want to talk about themselves so much and their accomplishments. So was that a little bit of a struggle for you or just, yeah. That was exactly it. <laughs> that so was the challenge. Do you get more comfortable as you do it? Yes, okay. absolutely, absolutely. And so, you know, you mentioned there are, you know, so many pitch competitions. Yeah. Um, after, so we participated in one accelerator program and through that program, uh, we were granted access to advisors, mentors. And this was a, a health tech focused accelerator program. But the value that I got from that was, I wouldn't say it was the pitch. The value that I got from that was interacting with people who would sit down and talk to me one-on-one -on -one and say, don't be ashamed about who you are, speak to it. These are the things that will help you. Mm -hmm. And that helped me to get it together Got it. when it came to that. If I, can, if I can just add a little bit to what Dr. Frazier said um, in speaking about, you know, knowing, knowing the process, sharing of yourself and why you are of value. Part of what I feel uh, a lot of people do with their creations is they're just, as you mentioned several times, your baby. It's something that's very personal. Yeah. And I think one of the things that may stop, especially women, is if they hear for their patent or trademark, th trademark the word no, rejection, that they take that at face value. So I would say, do not take it at face value. No means go and get educated, get more information to know, okay, so you're saying no to this, but what if I do this? 
and never take out that's my my piece of advice on this is never take no for an answer find out educate yourself even if you have a trademark or a patent attorney educate yourself on the system so when they're talking to you you have a better understanding that they're not saying that there's something wrong with your baby they're just saying maybe we put a little bit different color clothes on that baby right. to get you to where you want to be but the best way of doing that is educating yourself before you walk into that professional's office absolutely absolutely go ahead yeah i can't underscore that enough <laughs> Particularly the aspect of, um, you know, when you're when you're speaking, we do have a patent, you know, uh, counsel that is advising us, but accepting that you will receive the word no, you will hear it so many times. For every yes that we receive, there probably were a thousand, if not more, no's. And that's, you know, just inherent to the process of being an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's commonly coined grit and you know determination but truly you know your feelings will get hurt and then you say okay let's do it again <laughs> and if i may just one quick thing that you mentioned about exit strategy so to the previous question about how to um how do we leverage our IP portfolio. Um, for me also, that was a thought, right? So I don't know if I have two girls, um, four and six, and I don't know if they want to continue this business, right? I would hope that they want to continue the legacy. But if they choose not to, that portfolio becomes a part of the value of this business in my exit strategy, right? So that was a good point that you brought up as well. Yeah, so but let's talk about your experience with that. So I mean, I think that's an that's an excellent point. Um, and again, you went a little different, you know, path towards really uh, funding your business and getting that. What what did that journey look like for you? <laughs> <laughs> so honestly, I never thought about venture or venture capital or anything like that in funding my business. I just said, hey, we're going to take some savings and we're going to get this thing started. <laughs> And, so many and a lot of women do that. A lot of business owners do that. And so we bootstrapped it and, um, and it worked out. It worked out well in a way that we were able to do that and then reinvest those funds. And we came up on some opportunities that allowed us to build, build, build invoice creatively in order that the, um, the merchandise and the things that we were designing and purchasing were able to be paid for through the relationship that we had with a particular customer at that time. And so we just continued to reinvest in that way. We have at times um, applied for grants and been successful in some of those. Um, and that helped as well in building out our supply chain. And then we've also done some incubator programs that um, allowed us to refine our message and, um, and talk about ourselves, talk about myself a little bit more and about the business, and that it has um, enabled us to access the mentoring, the advisement, some of the things, the intangibles, if you will, of um, investment. Because time, someone's time that has expertise in the space that you want to get into is absolutely an investment as well. And so we've been able to leverage that in a way that has helped build. And I cannot stress the importance of network. Probably 95% of my business has been through network more than anything. It hasn't been because I have a registered mark or because of the copyrights in my portfolio. It is because of the network and the referrals that people have given because they believe in the work that I do. So yeah, we, we talk a lot in our organization about relationships and networking and the importance of that. But then as you're telling your story, being able to throw out little things like, oh, I hold, you know, a patent or these, I have these things trademarked, that always helps in the conversation, I'm sure, right, in Absolutely. developing some of those relationships. And so in terms of, you, you talked about a different type of investment, and that's the investment of people's experience and expertise in a mentor capacity. So what have those relationships done for you, and how have you gone about really finding mentors in the area that you're in? Oh, absolutely. So I'm not afraid to ask. So <laughs> <laughs> I have just met a number of people. Well, do you find that a lot of women are not afraid to ask or are we afraid to ask for help sometimes? I don't think we're afraid to ask for help. Um, I think that the follow-up is important. Mm. So I think that people meet, we meet a lot of different people and they say, give me a call 
a follow up with me. Oh, absolutely. I'd like to talk to you and give you some resources. And that's where we stop. And I, I find, and, I, and when I have conversations with people, they say, oh, yeah, I met someone. I'm like, well, did you follow up? What did you get? You know, <laughs> share with me. Um, but I, I would say I don't think I haven't met too many women that are afraid, okay. you know, to speak. I, I think that that's what it is. It's the follow up and the follow through yes. um, that really hinders a lot of us, you know. All right, well, we've got about a few more minutes, but I think that you all have shared some really good information. But what we always like to leave people with is really advice from you all, because clearly you all have been down a path. And everybody's path and everybody's journey is different, and we understand that. But there's some general things, breadcrumbs, if you will, that people can follow as they move through. And so I wanted to give you two ladies an opportunity to maybe share just a couple of tidbits, a couple of little gold nuggets that some of our entrepreneurs can use who are just starting out in business or may have been in business, but not really thought about the things that they have to offer, the importance of protecting the property, the intellectual property they have of, you know, patenting in, in some cases where it is, you know, appropriate. Where can, where can you give them some guidance in terms of that? What do they need to do? Yes, that's, um, I would say one of the things that I found to be of substantial value to us um, is leveraging free resources. Um, again, I wish I had known about the resources at the USPTO um, just to be able to go through that IP identifier I think would have been tremendously valuable at the earliest stages of learning, you know, what the different tools could be in terms of protecting our intellectual assets, our intellectual capital. capital. Um, the other thing, and, and when I speak about those three resources, even beyond what, we're, what we've spoken about, I think it was mentioned earlier, the Louisiana Economic Development. So economic development agencies, which exist throughout the country, exist um truly to help and provide support beyond those things that we think about typically when we think about economic development um, and helping small businesses that's a part of it and you know we leverage locally there's a new orleans business alliance there's the greater new orleans inc or gno inc um, all of these partners at the uh, economic development level have been tremendously helpful. And I would encourage anyone to just reach out and say, here's what I'm doing. I'd love to see if you have some resources, you know, and, and anyone um, would be willing to help you. The other thing that I've found to, to be of value, and I find myself reminding myself of that, more recently, even with the different stages of the business in the growth stage is, and this is something that was spoken by the late, great Kobe Bryant. So I will not take credit for this. That is the, you know, the, there's so much of a focus on the success, right? And so taking all the time that it took, all the hard effort, the sweat, the tears to get to raising that million dollars, that first million dollars, you know, that is publicized and, and seen for what it is. But the journey to get there was the success. And so reminding myself, and I would encourage anyone to think about that, even at, in the hardest times, the most difficult times, which you can anticipate that there will be some, to take it in because you're learning, even in those difficult times, and that journey is the success. Oh, wow. You did good. That was good. <laughs> um, so um, as I was trying to listen and take in her response, I was also thinking through um, what I could leave you with. And I would say this. Um, absolutely, we used some of the incubator programs, if you will. Um, we participated or I participated in the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program, which brought a ton of resources, advisors, um, experiences from other business owners in the room and in my cohort um, that helped to understand how to navigate some of the space and some of the challenges that we found as business owners or that we went through. And then I would also say, um, I didn't get to this point during the, the discussion on capital, but we received some no's as well, right? Um, in terms of 
applying for some of the resources out there, whether it was a line of credit with my business, the banking institution where my business was funded. And so I went to the Small Business Administration, SBA, and we were able to secure a loan there um, after being told no for a small line of credit, you know, at the banking institution because, or for whatever reason, but that no didn't deter us it or deter me. It just made me, you know, say, I know there's something available and there's been a huge focus. I've recognized that there's been a huge focus over the past three to five years in women-owned businesses. And so I'm trying to take advantage of it in every way possible. Um, and so, that has really been um, helpful. If you look around and look up and down and next to you, you will find a resource um, for people who are investing in women-owned businesses, in minority-owned businesses um, right now. And so I would say leverage those opportunities because they're pouring a ton of resources and thought into what they're offering us. Um, so that's been very helpful. And that's what I would leave you with, like really, really leverage those opportunities to learn. They may not be offering money, um, but they're going to give you something that you can take away. And then just take the time when you start to do the groundwork, because as a creative, I just wanted to create and put it out there right away. And had I done just a little bit of groundwork up ahead of time, then it probably would have um, saved me some losses, you know, in the future. And so that's what I would leave you with. Okay. And before, and I know we would definitely want to end with, you know, what uh, USPTO can advise women who are starting in their business and what directions to go in. But I wanted to pick up and piggyback on some things that you're saying in terms of the connection, because you had talked about um, networking earlier. And I think that that's incredibly important, but now we're talking about resources that are available. And yes, there is a, a new focus on women entrepreneurship as the in minority women in particular as the fastest growing entrepreneurial category out there and so women are and, and I, I hesitate to say they're building businesses at a faster rate i think women have always built businesses we just have not known those businesses outside of some of the very local areas and so now we are really starting to in a big way license and put out and promote our businesses and reach customers through social media and all these other online resources. So I think that that's important. But there is a women's business organization too, and there are certifications out there specifically for women-owned businesses and women enterprises that focus specifically on women entrepreneurs. And WeBank is certainly one of them. Our organization as one of the certifying agencies certainly helps women do that, connects them to resources and hopefully access to capital programs and government agencies and organizations and offices like USPTO. And so as one of the, I think probably, you know, just we're sleeping on USPTO in terms of the resources that are out there. You know, we hear a lot about SBDA, SBA, MBDA has stepped out in a big way, and we're certainly, you know, excited to have them as a partner. But tell us about how USPTO really partners with, as an organization, not just offers services, partners with entrepreneurs and helps them on their entrepreneurial journey. So great question. Um, I'm, I know we're short on time, so I'm going to pick one that I, I think is a, a huge impact. It's our pro bono programs. So we have two types of pro bono programs. One is there are 21 uh, pro bono where there are attorneys who volunteer their services to those who are of a lower income and don't have the opportunity to financially to uh, get patents or, uh, or, or trademark because they can't afford it. It is not a cheap thing. It's very expensive to go through the patent system or the trademark system. Um, and on top of that, attorneys are very expensive as well, not just the fees for it. Yes, they are. Attorneys. <laughs> so there are attorneys out there who are volunteering their services to those of a lower income to help them realize their dreams of patents and trademarks. Um, and we found that, uh, especially with women, so we have 13% of women who are, are uh, have their names on patents, but then we have about 40% who go through these pro bono programs, mm. which is telling us that it's out there. Mm. Their ideas and their creativity is there. It needs to be fulfilled. So the pro bono program is one with the attorneys. Also, law school clinics, Southern University has a law school clinic uh, where 
it's it's twofold. It helps both ways. So those who are of a lower income and can't go through the system, they are aided in getting their patents and their trademarks through the system. But also what we're doing is educating the lawyers while they're still students sure. on the process, on the appropriate process, giving them the education they need to be most effective for their clients once they're out and um, and registered. So those are two that I feel that um, are, are hugely impactful to those uh, who, are, who are trying to get to market. Mm -hmm. We also have a first time filer uh, petition. So if you are filing and you are of a micro entity status, which is a lower income status, you have never filed for a patent before, free of charge you can file a petition to have your application expedited the purpose of that is if you get through the application process faster you get to market faster with it which is pivotal sure to success of your your idea direct them to your website mm -hmm. uspto.gov <laughs> as, as simple as that look for inclusive innovation it'll tell you all of our resources not only uh, resources in some of the programs to help you get the patent, but the education, which I cannot stress enough, educate yourself. That is the key to getting to where you want to be. All right. Well, it was as simple as that, but let me tell you, this has not been simple. This may have been short. We could probably talk about this all day. I do this every day for a living. I have learned so much from you all. I want to thank all of our panelists. Thank USPTO for coming here for being here in this space and sharing so much valuable information with our women. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow, I gotta give these ladies another round of applause. Thank you for your insights. You left us with a lot of gems and as we all know, it's not an easy journey. Don't give up. The no's are often not yet, right? So you can't give up and we are here to help you. The USPTO is dedicated to help you. We do have a lot of resources. It can be overwhelming when you go to USPTO.gov, but don't worry. We will make sure we direct you in the right direction and we will continue to connect you with organizations and other federal, uh, our federal friends that will also help you build a successful business. So speaking of resources, I am now honored to bring to the stage my colleague, Jacob Choi. He is the Assistant Regional Director of our Texas Regional Office. And that name is misleading because they, they provide services more to um, innovators outside of the state of Texas. And so Jacob is going to share information about patents and the resources that are available to you. All right, good morning, everyone. Can you guys hear me okay? All right, it was uh, very wonderful to hear some of the successful stories, entrepreneur stories coming out of this region. Uh, my name is Jacob Choi. I'm the Assistant Regional Director at the USPTO Texas Regional Office. I'll, tell, I'll tell you guys a little bit more about the regional office concept as we, we are going to talk about a little bit about our history of the USPTO and as well as the opening of the regional offices as well as scratching the surface on what is a patent right as well as some of the resources that Valencia has mentioned earlier so I'll cover those topics and I, I think I have about 20 minutes to do so so I'm going to be very ambitious to try to do that and followed by we're going to have a colleague come back and talk about the trademark so it's okay. So just a little bit about me. I, uh, I started at the office about 22 years ago as a patent examiner. Uh, um, it was a kind of interesting journey and um, intellectual property is many of you know, it's not something that you guys think about or when you are in the education, it's something that not too many people are familiar with. So when I was uh, asked to, um, why well, I actually applied for the job, and then back then they actually had what's called a direct hire, meaning that supervisor can sit with you and then have an interview. Right at that moment, they can say, you're hired. Would that be cool? We don't do that anymore, but that was the process back then, okay? 
All right, so we have to go back to the history. Why is the USPTO ever existed? So in Article uh, 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the Constitution, it actually states the following. Promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited time to authors and inventors to exclusive right to their respective writing and discoveries. So right here and then, if you're actually interested in seeing the original, one of the original um, constitution, Dallas Public Library actually has one. So if you ever wanna come to the Texas Regional Office as well as see the constitution, you will see the one of the original copy there. So if our founding father actually realized the importance of protecting intellectual property. We talked about intellectual property being an asset. I would call it an intangible asset, okay? So function of the USPTO is actually pretty simple, but at the same time, it has been expanding over time. So number one is actually process patent application and trademark registration that's given, all right? But also I would actually highlight the fact that we as a USPTO disseminate patent and trademark information, education, and facilitate development of sharing of new technology worldwide. Okay, this has been sort of an added bonus as we are expanding the education program throughout the country. Uh, actually, uh, at USPTO, as we talk a lot about artificial intelligence, so if we as a USPTO do not set forth a law, we Congress does that. So we actually provide that information and uh, advocate for and things that we need to do with respect to things that are newly developing things as artificial intelligence in terms of the policy front so that people can benefit from the intangible assets. So just as surface introducing the US Patent and Trademark Office, we go by fiscal years, that's why FY stands for. So it starts, ends in the last day of September, and begins in October, the first day of October. So in that number, we currently employ over 13,000 people and out of the 13,000, we have about 8,000 patent examiners, over 700 trademark examining attorneys. And then we also have administrative judges that are assigned to the both patent side as well as the trademark side. I call them, they are the heart and soul our, of our engine in terms of running our agency. So if you're interested in about how many people, how many applications that we are actually receiving, last fiscal year, we received well over 600,000 applications and granted over 300. On the trademark side, it's actually a lot higher. Uh, 700,000 applications received and certified over 400,000. And the picture that you're seeing at the bottom is actually a, a shot of our headquarters located in Alexandria, Virginia. Again, if you are ever in the DC metro area, it's a place to visit, okay? Especially if you're in the innovation space. So back in 2011, through American InventSec, also known as AIA, allow the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office to open up regional offices. This is actually added to a section 23 of that bill, which was passed by Congress and signed by Barack Obama. So this actually allowed, the first open uh, office was actually in Detroit, Michigan, followed by Denver, Colorado, Silicon Valley, and the best one, Texas Regional Office, okay? The color coding that you're seeing is with respect to the outreach that we do. And it's nothing to do with uh, incoming cases and where we would uh, process those cases. So as our assistant regional director, I am actually responsible for day-to-day -day operation of this historic building. It does not come with the reunion tower if you've ever been to the Dallas area, okay? So we occupy a part of the first floor, entire fifth floor. We have a number of patent examiners and PTAP judges, also management team, as well as the sports staff members. So I say that this is one of the resources that you have. I know it's not close, but you can actually drive up and see us in person, interact with us, and ask questions about intellectual property, okay? We have a ton of other resource, uh, spaces that we actually use in terms of uh, prosecuting your cases, like the interview room, maybe a PTAP hearing room, and things like that. Okay, so we, when we talk about patents and trademark copyrights and trade secrets, as I know, and a lot of the invent, uh, entrepreneurs talked about leveraging those intellectual property as an asset to move forward with their innovation and creative space. So I will tell you that right now, if you are in that space, it's very important for you to know as to what it is. We're not asking you to file for it. We're not asking for you, it's, it's not a must. 
is something that you should be able to make a decision along the way, similar to you have a business strategy, right? But you would also need to think about and have intellectual property strategy in mind. And then strategically align them to your business strategy and then apply them and get it along the way. Okay, that's very important. It's not saying you have to, as a time, the time you are in an innovation space right now, you have you have to get a patent right now. It's about thinking about when does it make sense for you to uh, secure that intellectual property. Okay. So we talked about intellectual property being a intangible asset. So these are some of the things that you may actually own and you can compare to. And that the intellectual property kind of works very similarly. You can buy them from somebody, you can lease it, you can rent it out, things like that. So that's why we talked about intangible, intangible asset being very, very important, okay? So here's a great example of intellectual property. We use and interact with this device all day, every day. Did you know that there are over hundreds, if not thousands of intellectual property that are associated with it? To identify some of them, here is the phone that I used to own many years ago, Samsung Galaxy Note. I don't use this one anymore. It's in the graveyard. But, so it has the things like design patents, copyrights and trade secrets, patents and trademark. And these are the, some of the examples of it. Just to highlight, design patent kind of protects the look and feel of a thing or object, okay? And the patents actually needs to have, we talked about you having utility or functionality. So things like camera, battery, screen, and antenna technology, these are all have uh, utility patents associated with it. One thing that I would mention is that think about the, all the generation phone. I think the iPhone may be a great gener, uh, great example here. Think about the first iPhone that was created, which was kind of groundbreaking, and followed by multiple iteration of improving that technology over time. I think right now we're at a 15th generation, right? So why am I well why am I mentioning that? It's because sometimes people think about innovation. It has to be like a brand new light bulb idea. It does not have to be. It could be an incremental improvement over existing technology. It could be the battery technology technology where it lasts longer than before. Maybe it's a screen technology that is more vivid and colorful, right? So maybe it's an antenna communication where you're not losing the signals. So those things are also patentable. And I would say that takes a majority of the patent system in itself. As I, when I was a patent examiner many, many years ago, a lot of times I saw about 20% or so being the really creative, something very, something very, very new. But about 80% is actually improvement over existing. And this is how the patent system works. You disclose your innovation to us and you, got, you get a, secure, a limited amount of time to secure that intellectual property. Then, you turn it over to the public. For what? For them to do better, okay? That's how the ecosystem works. But don't, don't take that as what it is. If you know about the trade secret, on the other hand, certain things like a secret ingredients for your recipe can be kept secret, right? So you don't have to reveal to the public or disclose it at all. So knowing about four different types of intellectual property, intellectual property is crucial and apply to your business as you move forward. All right. So as I mentioned earlier, light bulb is a great invention. It literally lit up our world, didn't we? So uh, Einstein, actually, this is his patent back in many, many years ago, okay? So like, as I mentioned before, innovation does not have to be a brand new light bulb idea. What the patent does is actually, it is for a limited time, it's actually territorial. So if you get a patent in US, that means it's good for US. If you are selling your products in other parts of the country, let's say Europe, China, or Korea, or Japan, you have to secure your IP rights in that country. So that is what it means by territorial. It gets a little complicated and also expensive, but just note the fact that if your market is here in domestically, then you really don't at this time have to worry about international filing. But when you do, that's something that you have to worry about, okay? So it protects a new and useful process machine, manufacture composition of matter or improvement, as I said, mentioned earlier, improvement thereof. So not to confuse you, but there are three types of patents. 
Okay, so one is the most common one, it's called the utility patent application. Now this is term for about 20 years. It protects things like process, machine, article, manufacturer, composition of matter. If you tilt your head a little bit here, a little bit of uh, history, Abraham Lincoln, one of the president that we had, uh, he is the only president that actually holds a patent. Uh, it's actually what's called a, a flotation device. So when you're in the lake, it's uh, shallow, then it has a bladder system where you could uh, lift the boat and then get unstuck. So things like that can be patented. Here is an example of the design patent. There's a little bit of cross-section between the trademark and design patents. And so wanted to kind of also mention that. The design patent, again, it protects the look and feel of an object. In this case, as we know, it's a Coke bottle. And this protection is for 15 years. Plant patents, uh, it's kind of interesting one. And we do have a dedicated a group of examiners actually review this type of applications. So it protects the sexually reproduced distinct and new plant varieties for the next 20 years. Okay. So three different patents under the patents. But again, just want to emphasize the most common one is the utility and then followed by design. Okay, so we're going to play a little bit of game for the next uh, few minutes. So I have this thing called the weird and wonderful patents. Innovation knows no boundaries. I'm going to give you a title of the invention and brief description. Read it and then have a visual image in your head as to what that might be. The reason I do this as you were thinking about this visual image is the fact that the very important component of the patent is actually what's called the claims. It identifies meets and bounds of your IP protection, a very critical component of your disclosure. Okay. Have you come up with an idea? I'm going to show you what I think this patent is. Okay. One thing. <laughs> exactly. And I have a couple more. I have a couple more. We're going to have fun. So what I really appreciate about this innovation is that it's problem solving. So first, you're going to have a, you're going to have to have a TV to have this problem. Number two, you're sitting and you're wondering, why do I have to get up every single time I want to change the channel or the volume? So this person thought of this idea, which may, some of them may exist. A stick may exist, maybe sort of a grip handle. Yes but be able to be able to extend this rod and then so that I can reach the knob and be able to turn it, right? Something new. You may find it silly today, but guess what? After this innovation, other innovation came through as we know it, infrared light source, circuit board, battery technology. Now you guys have a remote sitting in your chair, comfortable chair or sofa, changing channels, right? So people can look at this innovation and say, I can do better. That's what I'm talking about. I have another one. Let's take a moment to read and again, have a visual image as to what this invention might be. I have to warn you, filing for your patent application is not as fun, but I'm trying to make it exciting, okay? You guys ready? Okay, here we go. So what defines fresh air, right? In this case, if you are in an environment where there's, there might be fire you know, happening, there's smoke everywhere. So in order to get fresh air, at least you wanna survive for a little while, this is the way you're gonna get fresh air. This actually was used in a movie film. I don't know if you guys remember. I, don't, I actually forgot the title of it. Not recent. Marissa was going to give you an answer when she comes up here for a presentation. Yeah, I can't remember right now, but it was actually so good that it was actually used in a movie film, okay? All right, keep wondering about that. Here's the last one everyone's going to appreciate. So again, take a moment to think about what this image of this invention may look like. All right, you guys ready? Here we go. We love our pets, right? So who cares if you get rained on? I don't care about that. I care about the pet 
So it's kind of reversible type of a, a umbrella situation or structure, I would say, to protect our little precious friends. They actually have it. They still sell it. They still sell it. So if you go to Amazon right now, they still sell it. <laughs> yeah. So again, I would tell you that when you talk about innovation space or patenting your new innovation, it's all about problem solving. Think about do you, that moment can come anytime. And I would say all of us have the ability, it doesn't matter if you're an engineer like me or someone else, you can sit and deal with the things that are surround you and then find out or think about, I can do better. Things that you can solve, right? That's innovation. Yes. Yes. Correct. Mm -hmm. So improvement, the, that, the, the now we've got to talk about some legal terms here and, and understanding of what makes it a patent, a valid patent. Examiners like myself, my old days, like what do we issue as a patent or not a patent? They talk, the panel talked a little bit about rejections, right? So our office have no problem telling you you are rejected. But you remember, there are a few things you can do to overcome those rejections. But in order to be a patent, the idea has to be in two different categories. Number one, it has to be new, right? Something new that has never been created before. Number two, it has to be non-obvious. Now, that's a little bit challenging to understand. If you change the color of your chair to gray to red, you have to think to yourself, is that obvious? Could anybody in the ordinary skill in the art in that field could do that? The answer is yes, then typically when the examiner, well, what I call them is a fact finders, they have to find these in a form of a prior art and apply in a legal manner. So they have to find probably another chair that talks about, you could change the color to say, yeah, your application is rejected. But let's say you add caster to your chair. So you can kind of move one place to another location without lifting your chair. You know, we know that they all exist today, but the time that it was invented, it did not, right? So those are the improvements that we're talking about. And, you know, we can talk a little bit about obviousness. Is it obvious or non-obvious? But it really comes down to uh, the testing of a well, great job that our examiners do. Okay. Hope that answers that question. All right. We're going to move towards the resources. Okay. So Valencia talked a lot about a ton of resources. I'm glad she didn't cover all of them, but I got some more for you, okay? So obviously we mentioned about the USPTO.gov website. So I have a new, uh, another webpage for the Texas Regional Office. So if you are interested in, you know, visit there. We have a ton of, I think the one thing that I would mention is that please sign up for our news article. We don't spam you. Uh, depends on the topic that you might be interested in. There may be like a virtual event that you can attend at home and learn more about what the offering might be. Okay. So we have a lot of virtual programs. All right. So next thing is, did you know that we have a YouTube channel? So go to youtube.com and search for USPTO and please look for that logo. It has been registered. Okay. So we have a ton of educational videos, short videos to long videos on various different topics. Um, so at any time, if you're interested in learning more about intellectual property, go there, including there's a woman entrepreneurship link right there. Okay. So patent pro bono program. So these are legal entities that are providing their free legal services, and there are a ton of them across the country. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So great question. So let me explain that. So patent pro bono program is only for the patents, but there is a thing called the law school clinic program, which actually deals with both patents and trademarks. Okay. And we do have that throughout the country, 
in the state of Louisiana, you got three law schools that are currently participating. Great thing about this program is the fact that you get to actually work with the students who get supervised by the IP practitioner, right? And they get the true live experience of working with the client. So you're giving them that, that opportunity. In return, you are essentially getting a free legal service of filing your application. Now, Valencia has talked about the price of filing for patent application. I slightly disagree in terms of the price. The filing fees are actually pretty nominal. It's the cost of the attorney fees are going to be really expensive. So in typically, uh, we put them in a different categories in terms of who's our, your inventor, large, small, and micro status. status. So if you're micro status, you get 80% reduction in all the fee structures. Okay, so typically, I think it runs around, we don't have a like specific price point, it depends on what you file, but it runs around $450. Okay, for provisional application, it's just a state uh, placeholder, it only costs about $70. Okay, but the legal fee actually gets you, so I just wanna make that point clear. That's why we provide these, we partner with the partners and then provide these legal services. Okay, so again, I, I wanna highlight, this is a, patent pro bono program. So if you are interested in working with folks here, uh, please contact them. They do have their own criteria, so you do have to meet their certain thresholds. PTRC is another great one. We're actually opening up on today. We're gonna be actually giving a certificate to the library in this great state of Louisiana. So PTRC is what it is, is a, um, is a library that we work with to provide information. There are librarians who are actually trained by us. One of the important aspects of filing your application, both patents and trademark, is the fact that you do some search. You do some research as to, number one, if it was a patent, is it has been created before? If it was a trademark, is this business name exists in the marketplace or commerce? So this is a very good starting point and where you can do that. Obviously, you can do some web browsing, but you can go to designated places like PTRCs and get that research completed. Absolutely, free of charge, because we are 100% fee-funded agency. It's our responsibility to share this information. Uh, last not least, but uh, inclusive innovation, we, Valencia talked a lot about that. There is an intellectual property identifier. I actually love this tool. I played around with it, it takes about 30 minutes. You just input some of your uh, standing as to what your business model is going to be, innovation and things that might be happening. It provides you with some information about what are the four different intellectual properties that you should consider. Yes. You know, I'm not gonna steal uh, my next speaker here. So we will talk about that. There's a, yeah, there's a distinction between the stately registered mark versus nationwide protection that you might be seeking. So Marissa, you wanna come up and do the rest of the presentation. And here's my office contact information address. Uh, please uh, contact us and visit us if you're ever in the area. Again, use, it, use us as a resource if you are stuck someplace or need more information about intellectual property, okay? Absolutely. Different. I am loving this. Because patent and trademarks are, are just, wow, they're, they're close, they're, they're family, but they're very different, <laughs> okay? So we're going to talk today about uh, trademarks, which is my favorite topic in the world. My name is Marisa Terrell. I've been practicing in this space for about 20 years. I've had the privilege of working at the, with the government and then in private practice and then um, was in corporate America at Lockheed Martin and Lidos doing in-house and then got a chance to go back to my alma mater, Howard University School of Law, where I, okay, you know, okay, so I was able to go back there and manage their uh, trademark clinic. There is the USPTO branded clinic. Okay, snapping in the top, I see you. Okay, and then um, got a chance to do my other favorite thing was just fashion law. And I taught fashion law at the law school for about four years. Back in, at the PTO, right before the pandemic, because my mom was just like, I think something's coming because she's like that. <laughs> so I listened, went back to government, and here I am, Was went back to the same law office where I started in 2000, 
same manager, a wonderful manager, and then I had a chance to apply for a job in the Office of Trademarks Customer Outreach where I get to do things like this. So this is my jam and I'm happy to be here. I'm gonna kind of race through these slides, but I've got these cards with the QR code where you can get links to everything. And of course, I think we're gonna make this deck available. So let's pop in here and get into it. We're gonna talk real quick about what a trademark is, what are some of the benefits of federal registration to your point, um, distinguishing it from state law protection and common law protection? How do you select a trademark that's gonna sail through our application process, right? And what is, again, this filing and registration thing, how much is it gonna cost you to do that? And then thanks to Jacob, I don't have to spend a lot of time on resources because you got a lot of them already. So fundamentals, we'll start with this. Every one of us is familiar with trademarks, but I like to define it as a shortcut for customers, a way for them to think about what product and service they're gonna purchase. So if you think about that bid in Apple, you're probably gonna think about an experience you had with Apple. I can think of a good one <laughs> that I had my mother, God bless her, I bought her a Mac and she does not understand anything about it. And hallelujah, they will speak to you on the phone as long as you want. So when I see that, I am like, yay, it's not me. Now she's got a whole group of people to talk to. So that's a good experience. But I'm also thinking about the goods and services they offer. I'm thinking about their computer products. I'm thinking about those mobile devices. I'm even thinking about the layout of the store. You know how you go into a, an Apple store it looks sort of the same, right? That's trade dress, that's, that's a trademark, a big trademark on that store, okay? So I'm thinking about those two things. Um, Coca-Cola, if I say that to someone in a restaurant, I'm not expecting to taste Pepsi, right? I'm specifically trying to distinguish what I want and I'm trying to make it clear. And that's why part of our mandate as the USPTO is all about the customer. We wanna make it so that they're not confused about where they're going. And that's why we're very strict when we um, receive an application to conduct that search. And there's a bit of a tussle between the owner sometimes or the attorney representing them um, who wanna say, no, this is not confusingly similar and why. And we wanna say, clearly it is. And this is why it's so you're doing this back and forth. That's the whole point. But if you think about Cardi B, remember that, um, see if I can do, oh, cool. remember when she did that? She had a problem. She filed the trademark application for that sound, and you can absolutely get a trademark on a sound. The problem with that she faced was that she did not tie it to a specific good or service that's sold in the marketplace. So you cannot have a trademark just pulling things out of the ether and saying, oh, this is my brand. No, no, no. It has to identify a product or a service that you're selling. Same thing with Blue Ivy. Beyonce had a similar problem. She listed about a million, not a million, Let's say she listed five different categories of products. She wasn't selling any of them under that brand name. And so again, no trademark protection, okay? So you have to be selling something, they call that use in commerce. I wish that I had had that privilege to speak to somebody like what, five or 10 paces from her, that lawyer, <laughs> but no ma'am, <laughs> no ma'am. All right, so now we know what a trademark is. What are some of the benefits of registering it with our office? So we know that in this country, the United States, your benefits can attach in two different ways. Well, really three, because of my friend in the front row talking about state law. But under common law, as soon as you come up with a trademark, so that would be your brand name, your logo, maybe you selling shoes with the red bottom, so it's a color red for shoes. Maybe you're selling jewelry out of a robin's egg blue box. Okay, that could be a trademark. Maybe um, it's the shape of a Hershey's Kiss. That's a trademark for there for specifically for chocolate. Or maybe you're selling a grill, a Weber grill, and it's like a circular kind of egg shape. Maybe you're selling um, those that fiberglass. I'm like renovating my, well, not, I shouldn't say renovating. I had a gas issue. So I had to like replace all of the pipes and, and the water, old house. In the walls is like this um, pink, uh, siding, right? That color pink representing Owings, Corning, fiberglass, insulation. They're the only ones with that color. So all of these are different trademarks, right? As soon as you create this trademark and you associate with a product that you're selling in the market, right? Or a service that you're rendering, you have a trademark. It's protected under common law and it's great. You get some benefits with that. Um, the problem is, is that under common law and state law, you're limited to the area where your mark is in use. So if you've obtained, let's say you're in, in New Orleans, you're uh, maybe creating 
I don't know, maybe some hairspray, <laughs> okay, as my hair is getting bigger and bigger the longer I'm here. Um, <laughs> perhaps uh, you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm selling it in Louisiana, you're protected there. But what if you wanted to sell it to me in Washington, D.C., where I am? That's not going to be protected under that common law protection or that state protection, okay? So you might consider doing something else. For the state, for federal, yes. So we're going to, right, for federal, you'll be okay because for federal, you get nationwide protection. Under federal rules, federal rules, there's what's called um, establishing use in commerce. <clears throat> That's a standard. So you have to be rendering your service, rendering under your mark, and having some sort of interaction between commerce across state lines. Maybe your customers are in and out of state. Maybe you're um, promoting on the internet. All of a sudden, you now can establish. It's, it's a legal analysis that has to be done, but that's pretty much the gist of it, okay? <clears throat> And the symbols you get to use as a common law protection, state law, is the TM or the SM. TM for goods, SM for services, but now these days we're using TM for both goods and services, and that's fine. You don't use that R in the circle because that's a privilege if you register with us, okay? That's when you can use that R in the circle, okay? Clear? We're talking about the symbols that you can use with your mark to let people know that you have a trademark. Correct. I'm going to just keep this mic because it's right. you in the room. Here, yes. here. Exactly. So if it's registered with our office, the USPTO, you may use that R in the circle. So if it's, if, but if it's registered just in the state that you're in, you can use one of the other ones? That's correct. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. But so then what's this thing about federal rights? Why, you know, what are some of the benefits that you get? Well, first, we know that those federal rights are created as soon as you register and it's approved with us. Okay, so you got to navigate through that application process. When I was working as an examining attorney, I lucked up and was assigned to Law Office 106. Back then, we had specialties and it was a cosmetics office. I don't think it could have been better for me. Um, but at that point, what I'm trying to say is that um, those these rights for federal Create it when you register with us, when you go through that application, when it's examined by a lawyer, no issues procedurally, no big substantive refusals, registration. Now, here you go, federal rights attach. What happens? You have a legal presumption that you own the trademark. This is some of the benefits. So that means if anybody infringes your mark, copies it. You can already start at a high level because you don't have to go to court and first prove that this is your mark, that you own it, mm -hmm. or prove that you have um, legal rights to it, right? Any of that, there's a presumption that it's already attached just because you have the registration. The other thing is you get to use it in all 50 states and U.S. territories. That's terrific. Plus, it puts the public um, on notice. And you can use that R in the circle. Another great thing is these days, mostly everybody is making, selling products that are constantly being knocked off, right? It's, a lot of us um, go to different countries to have our, our items created, um, and then we, they are coming back into the United States. Well, just as uh, Jacob was saying, trademark rights like patent rights are territorial territorial. So that means that once you obtain protection here, it is in the United States, not necessarily in China, if you're getting your products made there. And so what you could do is take that registration to the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, list it with them, and so that any of the uh, goods coming across our borders, they will be on the lookout and will seize items that they believe um, are counterfeit, okay? So that's a huge benefit that folks don't know about. That's a process, that's, a, that's part of their mandate. So that's helpful. So many of us are getting our things made abroad. All right, so how do you select a strong mark? Um, so our mission is to register marks. Your mission is to select one that's registrable, okay? Uh, and just to think about that not every trademark is enforceable. I'm gonna fly through this, but I think this is important to think about. Um, because common, there's common law and there are federal protections, when you're thinking of selecting your mark, 
you want to think of one that's going to sell through our application. But once you get a registration, you want to be able to enforce it against all others. Mm -hmm. So you've got to select something that's going to be strong. So here's an example. There's a company for the, this is a, a hypothetical, 1853, they were formed. They're selling jeans under this mark, Butterfly, okay? Now, you know that there's a company that was created in 1853 selling jeans that are that's celebrating their 200th anniversary. I'm talking about them. This is my make-believe fairyland. So here's a mark, uh, Butterfly, and it's for jeans. And they've been selling these jeans since 1853, so for 200 years. They never registered with the office, okay? They're operating under common law, and they're pretty happy with it. They feel like that over um, this 200 years, they've hit every state in the union, and they're thinking, I'm good to go. Then there's a competitor who comes up in 2023 and is thinking, hmm, I have a way. I see that they're not registered. How about I register it and sell it back to them? Or maybe whatever crazy nefarious thing they got going on. This is what they decide to do. So they file their application and it lands on my desk as an examining attorney. First thing I'm gonna do is conduct a search. Is it available, right? I'm gonna look at my database, but guess what I see? I will not see that original owner because they never registered with us, remember? They never applied for a mark through us, through our, comp through, through our agency. So it won't be there. So if I do my review, I won't uh, give them a refusal for likelihood of confusion because there's no, it's not in the database. And let's say everything else is perfect, so it registers. The question is, will this competitor be able to successfully enforce their registration against the original owner, right? The answer is, it's very unlikely. Why? Because the first to use in commerce in this country is what trumps it all. So it's still important for you to conduct your search and to look not only in our database, but where else? The internet. Back in the day, it was the phone book, but it's the internet now, because you want to make sure that you're understanding what the landscape is like before you file, because we don't give refunds. So if you file and it's not like a winner, <laughs> you got to start over, okay? So you're, you're, going to, you're going to search for the mark? Right, you want to put your mark into a search engine, say Google, and what you're looking for is, is there anyone else like this company, like this butterfly company that's been, that's in operation? Maybe they didn't register with the office, but are they still doing the same thing I'm doing? So, I'm the same brand. So in your example, the company that came way later registered the trademark, but they can't use it? They may because. try to use it, but this butterfly company would have the rights to now go after them, but it would be up to them to enforce their mark. Gotcha. Okay, okay. so they, they, they had it first. By, right, prior views. And so, so, so because they don't have a registration, when they step into the courthouse, they have to first prove that they own the mark. They, look, they got to find some receipts, yeah. find some old advertisements, establish that. But if yeah. they had a federal registration, they wouldn't have to be bothered. They could just say, I have a registered mark, and it's right here. Okay. So again, two, two of the main reasons why your application could be rejected, because remember, we want you to sail through the application process. We don't want you to have any problems. So the first one that you're going to think about is likelihood of confusion. That's the one where you're confusingly similar to someone else who got there before you, okay? Or your mark is very weak because it describes the goods or the services you're offering. Okay, and that one is tricky because these days marketers always want you to have some sort of descriptive term because it's easier for them to promote, but it's harder to enforce. So how do you get one that's going to go through, sail through this likelihood of confusion analysis and what exactly is it? So remember I said that the USPTO is all about the consumer. We want to make sure that the consumer is not confused. So what's the test? Looking at the marks themselves and we're saying, well, first I want to make sure we're clear that this is the test to determine whether another mark that you found is confusingly similar to yours and might derail your application, okay? Mm -hmm. So the analysis is, are the trademarks similar? That means similar in sound, appearance, or meaning, okay? And it's an or, one of those, sound or appearance or meaning. And then are the goods or ser and or services related? Let's do some examples. Let's say that your mark is T.Markey and you're selling shirts. You do a search and you find this one, T.Markey for pants. And you're saying, well, clearly there's no confusion, right? Because I'm not selling pants, so what's the problem? So remember the analysis. Are the marks similar in sound, appearance, or meaning? 
Yes. Yes. Identical. Are the goods related? Can I think of 10 or 15 brands that sell shirts and pants under the same brand name? Mm -hmm. Right? You can. So boom, this is a problem. You're going to get a refusal. Okay. Do one more. T. Markey versus T. Markey for shirts and pants. Well, we already know that these are related. So let's analyze the marks themselves. We're looking at T. Markey, T. Markey, similar in sound, appearance, or meaning? Similar in sound. Okay, so we got a problem. It's gonna be a refusal there. How about this one? Only thing that changed here are the goods. Shirts, golf flags. I'm not a golfer. I wouldn't know this off the top of my head. I'd have to do some research. I'm on the internet, internet now looking for companies that sell golf flags and shirts under the same branding, brand name. If I can't find any, or if it's a real struggle, unrelated. You see what I'm saying? And but so it's this, still the same sound. Right, but remember, this two-part analysis, you got to have both. Okay. okay. Because there are lots of marks that are identical that, that coexist. Think Delta, Delta for sorority, mm -hmm. Delta for faucets, Delta for airlines. Okay. Different channels of trade, unrelated goods and services. Okay. Dove for soap, Dove for chocolate. Different channels of trade, okay? Gotcha. Okay, so you want to search. You got to search because this is due diligence. It's part of your good faith attestment that this is your mark and you've done some work for it. Where are you gonna search? Remember, you're gonna start with our database because that's where the USPTO examining attorneys are looking, but you won't stop there. You're gonna also search the internet. One great thing is that we now have a new search system. The end of this month, we replace the old search system with a new one that we hope is much more user-friendly. If you go to our website, you will see my little face along with my manager walking you through this new search system because I'm gonna tell you, we were all shook when this came down the pipe because again, I consider myself an expert in the old system, but even I had to learn the new one. If you're just starting, you're in a great position because you can learn with all of us along with all of us. Um, take a step back real fast. You can, as Jacob was mentioning, Go to one of those wonderful Louisiana intellectual property trademark clinics and let them help you do that search, okay, for free. Or go to the, the libraries that he, he was talking about, the PTRCs, let them help you with that search. So you don't have to feel like you have to do this by yourself. That's what you're hiring the lawyer to do. But I'll tell you the great thing about working with lawyers, you've got leverage. They do something crazy, you can report them to the bar. And they're all nervous about being reported to the bar because that's your livelihood. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking, you know, you can say, listen, I want you to call me second, third, fourth time. They haven't called. You call the bar. They will call you. OK, because they are not interested in that smoke. OK, <laughs> selecting a trademark, the strength of your mark. OK, quickly. Just like I said, you want to avoid the likelihood of confusion. You want to avoid using a trademark that doesn't indicate where your goods and services come from. Does a trademark describe your goods or services? Does it describe your users, a feature, a function, a purpose of your goods or services that you may have a problem? Let's look at this infographic. You wanna stay in the red zone, fanciful, arbitrary, or suggestive marks. We'll start with generic. Generic terms are not even marks at all because if I'm selling a dairy-based beverage and I'm calling it milk, that's not helpful. <laughs> I am not going to be able to figure out which of these, all of these um, companies selling milk, who's the best? How would I know? I wouldn't. But guess what? There is a company called Milk selling wonderful primers for your face. And just to make sure that you're not, you can wear a mask without having all your makeup come off. It's called Milk and I use it. Okay. That's a great mark for cosmetics. Terrible. A dairy-based beverage. Do you see the difference? Yeah. Okay. Descriptive. Apple pie for apple-scented candles. Why? Because everybody in that industry who's selling candles that smell like apple pie is going to want to use this term. Why should you get the monopoly? Mm -hmm. Right? You don't want to do that. And plus, if you did, how many cease and desist letters are you going to write? Mm -hmm. Okay? It's going to be a challenge. Stay away from those. But I'll tell you, if you think about it, you might say, well, well, really? Because I go into the store and I see lots of terms that appear descriptive. How do they get through? There's a process called acquiring distinctiveness. If you are using a descriptive term over five years and you can show that you have educated your customer enough that they can find you in the marketplace and know it's you, then you may be able to obtain descriptive 
get a, get a trademark registration for a descriptive mark. But again, you got to enforce that. So if you're concerned about the cost of a trademark application, you might not want to go that route because you'll be constantly having to battle, okay? So then try to stay in the suggestive. This is where I love to stay because it's imagination. It requires a couple steps to figure out what the product is. So you think about copper tone or suntan lotion. It's not literal, okay? But you take a couple of steps and you can kind of get to what this is. Great mark. Attorneys love it because it's strong. Marketers love it because there's a couple of steps to the product. And then arbitrary, real terms in the dictionary, but not commonly associated with the product. Apple for computer products, genius, right? Blackberry, genius, right? Gap for clothing, genius. Arbitrary terms. And then fanciful made up, Xerox, Kleenex, um, Pepsi, made up words, um, not in the English language. But you gotta be careful because escalator, like also made up, but somebody didn't really do their enforcement and now it's generic and it's not really a mark at all, okay? So filing and registration, you're gonna file online with us. We have two different um, types, T's plus, little discount. The main, is that the main uh, fee is 350 per class and I'll explain that in a minute. That's our standard. 250 again, you get $100 off. And what's the, what's the difference really? The $250 option means that you're going to select your description for your goods and services from our database. That means that when the lawyer gets it, they don't have to struggle with, is this acceptable? Is, you've, you've already accepted pre-approved wording. Because remember the, that oh, example I said? You gotta make sure that, those, that you're listing goods and services that you're actually offering in the marketplace under that mark. So the application is gonna require you to list them out. If you sell clothes, you're gonna to have to say what it is. Baby clothes, baby t-shirts, t-shirts, um, pants, skirts, you gotta list everything out that you're doing, okay? But when it comes to cosmetics, we'll take cosmetics as a term, right? You don't have to say lipstick, mascara, whatever. So you wanna to go to our database and see what's acceptable before you file, because remember, no refunds. And our rule about IDs, identification of goods and services is, you can always limit, meaning narrow what you provide it, but you can't go beyond. So I know somebody contacted me recently saying that they sought a registration for chocolate truffles, and now they wanna say like chocolate bars. Can't, they gotta refile. But if they had said just chocolate, well, I don't even think chocolate by itself is not acceptable, it's too broad, because it could be in a lot of different classes. Um, but you've gotta go in there and see what's acceptable. That's a little research on your part, or hire that lawyer. Hire that student attorney, let them do that work for you, and then, you know, go on about your day, <laughs> okay? So um, another thing I wanna say is, so you're, for 250 pre-approved wording, there's also some other upfront requirements, but there's some information that I'm gonna give you to figure that out. Um, but let's talk about what I mean by class. This is government, you know. Well, we got to have some order, right? So when you talk, when it comes to classifications, every good and every service in the, in the world it's supposed to be classified in numbered classes one to 45. So under that butterfly example, if you're selling blue jeans, clothing is always in 25. So that's gonna be one fee of $250. But most folks who are in the apparel business don't stop at just apparel, right? They maybe wanna do sunglasses, class nine, or maybe they wanna do mugs, class 21, or maybe they're doing, I don't know, some sort of podcast in like 41. Do you understand what I mean? So every, it all depends. You don't have to do everything at once, pace yourself, but just understand that's how the fees are accrued. That makes sense? Okay. Classes for, there's, give me an example of a class for a service. Services, dentistry, services. Okay, okay. Is podcast is a service, so that would be, uh, in a class, and so podcast is like I said, at forty-one. I don't know where dentistry lies, but um, like fashion design, not in dentistry. fashion design would be in another one. You know, Con yeah. consulting, but consulting is financial consulting, thirty-six, right? But like consulting and construction, completely different. So each each so there's there's categories for different types of consulting. Absolutely, because think about it: you getting a trademark on consulting because that could be in any field, how would I be able to conduct a search to determine its availability if it's that broad? I'd be searching for weeks 
Right. 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 I'm going to need to narrow it somewhat. And so we're going to require you to narrow it and tell us what you're doing or you just, yeah, you're going to be, you're going to have to, because yeah. otherwise it's just, um, it's actually untenable. I would say for it, for an attorney. Okay. Okay. I'm almost done. All right. So the total fee is determined by how many classes that are in your application. Okay. Requirements. It looks very simple, right? You just need to know your mark. If you do it in standard characters, that means lowercase or uppercase letters. You can use it in any color, shape. I'm sorry, any color, size, or color. Okay. Color, size, font. That's what I want to say. Okay. So that's great. It gives you some flexibility. Um, it could be a JPEG, like an image you upload, your logo. If it's black and white, you can use it in any color. But if you upload color, you're restricted to that color always. Okay. You want to give your list of goods and services. You want to tell us if you're actually using the mark in commerce, because remember, that's when your rights attach. We want to know when that started. Um, you can also say, maybe I'm intending to do that. I'm not actually doing it yet. You could file and say, I'm intending to do it. And then when I, the office will do their review, if they approve it, you get a chance to now provide use. Okay, so if you're saying, I want to, maybe you you think about something, you haven't actually brought it to marketplace, you can file and get in line. We're behind eight months, so it's a good idea. Okay. Contact information, of course, we need to know who the owner is because we communicate by email. And because all this information is on the public record, there are lots of third parties that are trying to contact you, offering you services, saying that they can represent you and trying to help you navigate our system. I would say go to our database, our database and our website first because they tend to give you wrong information, trying to get you, trying to hustle you basically to get more money. And then you want to give us the filing fee. All right, it's up to you to enforce your rights. We're not an enforcement agency. We just give registrations out or, re or refuse them. So it's up to you to do that. And the one great thing about trademarks as compared to patents <laughs> is that ours will last forever if you renew it, okay? The date your mark registers, you're just gonna knock that date right in there. You're gonna count forward five years. And between that fifth year and that sixth year, you're gonna file your renewal documents. And there's another fee there that you're going to be charged a fee based on your class. It's like, I think it's 225 per class at that point. And then every 10 years, you're going to have to do the same thing, okay? The 10th year mark, you're going to have to pay something else. It's called a section nine. It's like a declaration that, yes, I'm still using. And then, I'm yes, I'm asking to renew. Um, the fee is 525 per class, you say. And that's every 10 years. Now, some folks are like, how in the world? I don't even know where I'm going to be in 10 years. I don't even know if I'm gonna have the same email in 10 years. Most folks will, again, that lawyer, <laughs> let them be responsible for that, for tracking that, so it could, because you have leverage if they don't, or a third party, but again, with third parties who are not attorneys tracking things for you, they go away, what are we gonna say? Oh, my company went bankrupt, right? They don't really have the same responsibilities. And then help. We've already went through all of that, but here's some information and I'm going to pass these these cards out with a QR code. And I hope this has been helpful to you. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you, Marisa. And thanks again, Jacob. I've been at the office for 34 years. I started when I was five, by the way. OK. Um, but I continue to learn from the subject matter experts because I do see myself eventually being a woman entrepreneur. So we really appreciate, again, our gracious host, uh, Webeck South, and being here in this beautiful location, WB Collective here in New Orleans, our esteemed panelists to share their insights, and we all should have a good way forward. Now, we gave you a lot of information. It is a lot. And we know that the work that you're doing is hard work and we genuinely appreciate you. But the good news is we are your USPTO and we are here to help you to succeed throughout your innovation journey. Um, I, I suggest that when you're going to our website, start off with USPTO.gov forward slash inventors. On that website, you're going to get connected to all the information and resources that both Jacob and Marisa talked about and um, the information that was shared during the panel will all be found on that site. It doesn't end here. If you go to our events page, you're gonna find programs that educate you throughout the year. We got a lot going on and it's very important to give you what you need, okay? Um, please share 
what you learn with others, because that's another way we're going to succeed, because what you don't know, you don't know, right? And so it's important for us to support one another, share information with your friends and family. Um, this program has been recorded. It will be available on USPTO's YouTube page. A lot of people don't know about it, but hey, we got a lot of great um, videos and you can find more videos with Jacob and Marisa and many other subject matter experts. And last but not least, we need your feedback. This program is for you. We wanna make sure that the content is relevant and we are meeting you where you are at a time and place that's convenient for you. So please take a few minutes to complete the survey and forward the email. We're gonna give you a lot of links to these resources with friends and family. Thanks again for your time and have a great weekend.